Indeed, Houston, we have a problem. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is wonderful to see everyone out. And uh, it's uh, the crowd getting a little bigger there. That's wonderful. You know, I love uh, intimate crowds. Do you? How many of you guys just love being intimate with people? Not, not too intimate, six feet apart, right? Making sure that we have our, our social distancing for some of you. For most of us, we just go in for the love. Yes? Yeah. yeah, we enjoy that. So welcome, welcome, good morning. It is wonderful. Did, did John do a wonderful job? Let's give him a hand. Let's give everybody a hand. Good, great job. And understand this. A church, you know, uh, we have our team. Uh, Jesse's on. I, I saw that she's on Facebook. We've got uh, Jesse and Jesse. And, and Jesse, all Jesse's are on. Um, <laughs> on our, our Facebook Live, they're uh, in different parts of the state, and, uh, different parts of the country. We have other folks out there. So thank you for being with us. We're just thrilled you're with us through uh, that technology. So absolutely wonderful. I'm encouraged to see everyone out there, of course, uh, our Facebook. All right, we're going to jump right into the message this morning. And uh, this morning we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. This is a joke, right? Hebrews copy. <laughs> the book of Hebrews chapter 4. This morning is where we're going to kick off, or should I say launch, oh. our a message uh, this morning. So as you're getting there, how are you going to get there? Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Let me share this. Let me give you a little bit of direction. Let's, here's the experience today. Today, I want to talk to you about one of the most avoided topics, probably, in the Christian faith. And it's a shame because if a Christian misses this topic this morning, a believer, if a Christian or a believer misses it, they will never realize who they are, what they can truly do, or how to attain their very best life in God, their very best life in His plan, in His Purpose. In other words, if a Christian, a human being, whoever, misses this topic, they will miss life. Our topic this morning, reality. Reality is our topic. So over the next few moments or so, I want to talk to you about reality and why it is so important as well. I want to share some dimensions of reality, different aspects of reality, and how to use those dimensions, if you will, how to use them to transform your life into a better life. Isn't that why we step into the Christian faith? Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, my hope by the end of our time together, you'll realize there is a better life waiting for you, whoever you are, because you can always get better. But there's a better life waiting for you when you choose, and let me put it this way, when you choose to bow down, bend your knee to reality. Hear that this morning because we are to bend our knee to certain things. Bend our knee to reality. Make it our best friend rather than our worst enemy or our biggest problem. So with that, read with me our opening verse as we launch our message this morning titled Houston. We have a problem. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 reads this way. I'm going to read it and pause a little bit here. Are you with me? Are you is your mind with me? Or are you somewhere else? Are you making the choice to listen or are you just here? Make the choice to really grab onto this because this is going to change your life. I promise you. If you bend your journey and bow down to reality, that's where we're at, right? For the word of God is alive. And what's the next word? Active. 
Say that as loud as you can. Active. Active. Can we say that again? Active. Active. Carrie, let's say passive. Did I, did I, I, I want to make sure I'm reading this right. Passive in the sense of passivity. So many young Christians just left. When I say young, I mean, you look old, but you're young, you know what I mean? You look, you're a child in the dumb world, you give them the passive in their faith. For the Word of God is alive and active. Now, listen to this, because this has been a misinterpreted. For you that have been in the Christian faith and you are on the defense, I need you to hear this, because if you miss this, you'll continue to do your reality rather than God's reality. Listen to this. For the Word of God is alive and active. I'm reading it over here. That's fun. <laughs> There's our scripture. But sharper than any double edged sword. Christian that's been in the Baptist. Uh, I need to correct something here because this has been misinterpreted so often. It's wrong. I'm saying it on camera to let my brothers, my theologians, my biblical brothers and sisters to know that it's wrong. This has been preached saying that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And they say that the Word of God is like going into your belly and it's got a double edge and it's going to hurt. And it's gonna... You're wrong. I want you to read this in the proper interpretation this morning. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any defense that you might have. Sharper than any defensive weapon. Mm -hmm. Remember Peter in the garden? Where he decided to jump out and cut off the guard's ear with a double-edged sword? And what did Jesus say, folks? He said to that Christian, the Christ follower, he said, Get behind me, Satan, because you're wrong. We don't fight in the defense. We don't cut people's ears off. We don't use that tool. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We are to fight, but it's not on the defense. It is on the Offense. You know football, do you think the offense is fighting? Mm -hmm. Let's go back to, for the word of God is alive and active. It's not passive. So many Christians also interpret this. Well, if we're not going to fight, you're going to fight. But you're going to fight offensively with the ball to go make some touchdowns. Amen. Am I wrong here? Nope. And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit. Joints and uh, marrow, that's the heart. It judges, it is the word there. It, the word, judges the thoughts. Your thoughts and the thinking patterns that go with that. And attitudes. Do you have a defensive attitude? But you have an offensive attitude. When you read like a book, like we talked about last week, the attitudes of the heart. Let's pray into this message. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Lord, we thank you for reality and giving us the opportunity to live within it properly. We say sorry for not making reality our friend and thinking it's our enemy. Forgive us. And we ask for truth and for your spirit to fill us, fill us up with active and alive and aliveness. Fill us up with pure life to realize your true satisfaction and fulfillment. And we surrender all to you in Jesus' name. And everybody says? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Yeah. Good, because I have a question for you. Sorry. <laughs> so let me ask this morning, is reality your friend or your enemy? Regrettably, for many, it's their enemy. 
And people see reality as something to fight and destroy that defense again, rather than fighting an offense and adding value to life or truly making reality their friend. Let me say this. If you don't take anything away except for this one thing, you're ahead of the game. Reality is always your friend. If not, you're out of touch with reality. Everybody should see. It's not that weird. Reality will prove itself to be. So to begin, let's define reality and how important it is to understand it so that we can use it to fix the problems of not living in God's reality. That's the problem. In God's reality, by the way, all of reality is God's. Are you with me? Yes. Where we want to live in a reality where purpose, not problems, and life resides. So with that first, what is reality? To begin, let's define reality and how important it is to understand it. First part of our core verse this morning reads this way. It's on the screen there. For the word of God is alive and active. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now the word word here, quotation not, but the word word here in this passage can be interpreted as reality. For Let's put it up there. Here it is. For the reality of God is alive and active. And you might go, oh, well, that's how you're interpreting it. I'm going to prove it right in a moment. Not because I have to be right, because I want to live right with you. We interpret this now both through the subjective word of God. That's the Bible, folks. But that's only one side of God's word. You see, when you speak a word, that's only one aspect of who you are. Word. Bueller. 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 But there's another side, objective side, or there's tonality to that word. As well, there's nonverbals or action. Again, I wish my wife was here because I love this moment when I get the opportunity to explain what this is. And if Sherry was sitting here, I would look at her and say, to prove this to be so is sweetie. Y'all can share this. <laughs> sweetie, I'll let John be that uh, share it. <laughs> sweetie. I love you. <laughs> I said it, right guys? How many of you guys said it when you were married? Your word said it. Let's see if I can get you honey blood like a <laughs> Sweetie. <laughs> you did it. I don't think I thought did it there. That's pretty good. You got it. First time I'm crying on the other side. <laughs> okay, thanks. John, I wasn't expecting that. But, was, yes, before the word of God is reality. And it's alive and active. When we do have a subjective side, which is the Bible, and then we have another side of God's Word known as the objective truth or creation. Two books that we need to look at when it comes to the Word of God, because if you only get the Word without God's tonality, without His action, you're not going to interpret it properly. You're going to walk around going, I've got the Word of God, that's the truth, that's the authority. But the tonality, and I think that goes with that, the sense of creation. If you don't understand that, the sense of the objective truth, you're going to miss the interpretation of God. Amen. And this is so powerful because we want to interpret words for other people or for God. Matt, isn't it amazing how, how much you don't know or what you meant to say? Everybody else knows better than me what my words meant. Anybody ever? I know what you meant. I 
We interpret the Word of God both through the subjective Word of God, the Bible, and the creative Word. And we know this because John 1.1, let's, let's kind of interpret this now with the subjective Word of God, our authority, which says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who knows this scripture? Very familiar. Now, let me, let me read it again, but with reality, and then we're going to see where I get to the interpretation. In the beginning was reality, and reality was with God, and reality was what? God. Now you're like, well, wait a second. Well, again, all we have to do here is replace that word with reality to understand that the word uh, definitely means reality. Reality both, again, inside of you and outside of you. Therefore, we have to get the word of God in you both objectively and subjectively, if you expect to live in God's reality outside of you. God is real. Amen. And we see this reality of, uh, alive and active in the person of Jesus Christ. 13 more verses later, we get into John 1, 14. This is how I can, this is how I know that I know that I know that I know the word is reality. Because here it says, the word became what? Flesh. I want everybody to take it and touch your flesh. Is that reality? You bet it is. And the Word of God interprets itself. Quit telling God what He meant. <laughs> it is so. Ah. The Word of God became reality and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, objective truth, full of grace and truth. As I shared in Sunday school, full of grace and truth. Truth is your daddy and grace is your mom. And there's the marriage. And he became reality. Yes, let me say this. Jesus is real, folks. In reality, that is full of grace and truth that directs people, that leads people, if they choose, you have a choice, if they choose to be fulfilled and live in that satisfying reality with Jesus as their best friend. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus your reality? And is he your friend? Your friend where you get to eat problems for breakfast. <laughs> Rather than problems eating you for dinner. You do So many Christians are eaten up by problems. Yeah. Houston, we have a problem. Please understand this. Again, I said it, let me say it again. Reality is always your friend. The reason, well, I don't know what the reason. I got my notes well. I read them. The reason everything else is a fantasy. I just said it. Think about it. To get real results in your life, in any of your relationships, you need to be in touch with what is. Not what we wish things should be. Mm -hmm. How many Christians are chasing the horizon thinking heaven's on the other side of the horizon? No. Reality is now. Amen. The only thing that is going to be real in the end is what is, and what is, is reality. Don't you miss it. Deuteronomy 7, 6 shares this thought with that in mind. Know therefore that the Lord, notice all the caps there? We'll go ahead and put all caps reality there. Know therefore that the reality, your God, is God. He is the faithful God keeping his promises of love to a thousand generations.
for those who love him and keep his, what's the next word? Amen. The Testament. But here we come. New Testament. Here comes Jesus. What is? God is. Amen. And we must first and foremost make him our best friend if we are going to meet the demands of reality in this very prom uh, problematic, toxic world where people have an attitude of, I'll do what I want. And, and they're very narcissistic and prideful to the core, and they think they're all that in a bag of Doritos with the Mountain Dew on the side. Because we have Christians doing that all over the place. They're not going to take direction. They're not going to follow the line. That's fine. You do it your way. See if this world doesn't go down the drain of the Now at this point, most Christians would say, God is my friend. But let me use the reality word. I would say this. Really? Is he really your friend, or is he like that imaginary friend you conjured up when you were an immature and unenlightened little child? You know, the friend uh, you created based on your world, your teachings, your traditions, your experiences? You remember that? A uh, Barney comes to mind for some reason here. Yeah, that's what I say. The Red Testament is fine for the hate Barney. <laughs> So I'm glad I got you. Know, I just <laughs> <laughs> got a little too serious after just not like things up there. The friend that we create in our world rather than in the real world of God and how he created you and the world he created outside. Many Christians believe God or Jesus is their best friend. But is this so, or is it all just a fantasy? And I'm not going to answer it for you. We're going to let the Bible answer it for you. John 15, 14 through 15 says this. This is Jesus speaking. Are you, excuse me, you are my friends if you do what I was the next command. command. This is important. His commands, his principles, his requests. Uh, we can say uh, his instructions, his principles. Uh, his laws, his expectations that are ultimately out there, not in your cave. So you are my friends if you do what I command. And he says this, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Let me pause here. So I have to ask this question. Do you know the principles? Do you know the expectations? Do you know the commands of Jesus? All 49 of them that sit in the Gospels. All 50 of them, or nearly 50 of them that sit in the Pentateuch or the first five books of the most. Do you know them? If you don't, you're not a friend. The Bible says you're a servant because you don't know the master's business. Come on. We've got to get serious in our day and age or we'll miss the mark as Paul talked about in his writings. But he says instead, now, Jesus, if you do understand, now let me say this, you don't have to know all of them. You just have the attitude that you're going to lean in and understand those principles, that you're going to do it together in your different relationships. My relationship with God, my relationship with myself, my relationship with my family, my relationship with the church, my relationship with the community, my relationship with the world. That's what that means. It doesn't mean you have to be all about the bag of burritos and know everything. You're one person. John knows some principles that I don't know. You know some, and we connect. And we bond and we connect. That's togetherness, and through that we build the body. Amen. What do you think for a second? You can, but it's the intent, it's the motive. Where Jesus says, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father. All of history, through all of history, throughout all of design, everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Amen. That's the word of God. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you do what I command. Do is act, not passive. Folks, Facebook, wherever that camera is, goes all over the place now. Are you 
doing your own traditions like the elders have a tradition of sleeping in. I have the tradition of feeding my feelings, my intuition. Jesus said, when Pharisees asked Jesus, why are you not following the traditions or habits of the worldly church? Jesus says, I do only one thing, follow the commands of Jesus. When we feed our habits, we can call them traditions, don't we? Ask, I'm speaking to the church, the Pharisees, the world system, the church who uses guilt and shame and condemnation rather than grace and truth and love and time to really develop a healthy faith system known as Christianity. Jesus said, are you my friend? If you're my friends, then you'll do what I command. Are you a friend of Jesus in reality? Or, Houston, I have a problem. Folks, if you're not functioning and operating and preparing in the way of Jesus based on your uh, unique design, the objective truth, the word of God, that's who you are, how he hardwired you, how you've been made through the Father, and you're not developing intentionally through the truth uh, and grace of God, then your reality as a Christian is a fantasy. That, my friend, is reality. We have to get out of this fantasy and start living in reality. And then it close that definition on, objectively speaking, when looking up the definition of reality in the dictionary, which is just agreed upon source by the authorities, and I know what that means, but it's a good source, typically if you find the right one, defines it this way. It says reality is the state or quality of being real. Let me ask, are you being a real Christian? When a Christian is being real, they are living in the reality of God and how God made them to be. They have an overall perspective that's a worldview about life that aligns up with God's understanding, uh, with his interpretations, uh, with his viewpoints. Not mommies and daddies and the cultures and I love singing about America and stuff, but that's not our ultimate, that's not our ultimate uh, understanding and interpretation. God is. And if you've got a problem with that, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you because your loyalties are too low. Nobody in here can argue. I was 21 years proud to serve, but don't you dare forget for a second that is at this level. We've got to ascend as Jesus did and make sure our loyalty are at the proper place so that we can transcend our own little meanings of life so that we can really add value to the bigger picture of life. That is reality. Amen. We have an overall perspective. That, let me say this, when you have it that way, you're fruitful. Not only spiritually speaking, because we're like, you got to be fruitful as a Christian. Well, you got to be fruitful in two areas, practical and spiritual. I know this, home, this, this church here is our home, but is it practical? Yeah, I, I'm so thankful for our home. How many of you guys live in a home? Most of you get any homes today? You have a home. That's results. That's good. I hope your house, I should say, is a home because you're living in the Christian faith properly in that house where it becomes a home. We do this through the relationship with Jesus, our best friend, and other Christians who are supporting. With other Christians, let me say this, who are supporting friends. I want you to look around. Look around. I'm going to tell them what's going on. Give it all. Look around. These are your supporting friends. Not your enemies. This is what reality is. God and being real 
in faith. Let's end with looking at our scripture again. Hebrews 4 12. For the reality of God is alive and active. Are you alive and active in God's reality or all the problems of life? And if you are alive and active, are you on the defense? Because if you are, it says sharper than any other, or excuse me, sharper than any double-edged sword. It, that's reality and word, penetrates even the dividing soul. I don't know if you noticed this, but America is divided in its soul. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of families in our church that are divided in its soul. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of communities, a lot of relationships that are divided in their soul. Take it in. And Spirit joins in on it. It judges the thoughts. There's one thing I can share with you. You need to learn how to think properly so you can get a good thinking pattern to think like Christ the way you It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The heart again is your desires, your interests, your hopes, your dreams, that's your heart. It judges your attitude if it's in line with God or not. The message Houston, we have. 